instance, get grape juice out of the grapes. And they taught me that uh, what they would do is they would gather all the grapes into a big, a big area and, and people would go in there, their bare feet, and they'd walk on the grapes to squeeze the grape juice out. And, and as I looked down at, at the grape juice I was holding in my hand, just thinking of, of uh, eating grape juice squeezed out from somebody walking on it was uh, uh, something that really thrilled my heart. But of course, they, they have different practices today. Uh, but you know, when you think of that, that pressure that would force out the juice, we, we in life will go through some stressful and some pressure-filled circumstances. And while we don't look forward to those times, and in the midst of those times, we can feel quite discouraged. In the midst of those times, we may ask, does the Lord hear? Does the Lord care? To know that through it, the Lord is producing something valuable. And really, that pressure can be something very, very good. It's something that our Lord Himself endured. Tonight, as we look into Mark chapter 14, as we get back to the Garden of Gethsemane, I, I want, I'm not going to make a, a point of applying this too much to our personal circumstances. Uh, but through it, I, I would ask just that you consider again, as you go through those stressful and, and difficult times, how do you respond? And in those difficult circumstances, what do you produce? I want us to consider tonight how the Lord, as He went into this night of great pressure, this night at the press, how He responded and what was produced. Consider in Mark chapter 14, beginning verse 32, they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be very sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. At the press, we look into this passage in Mark chapter 14 as we compare it with other scriptures. We uh, find a few more details about this account, what Jesus Christ endured that night. The Gospel of John reveals to us that as he went into this garden, as he went into that Mount of Olives, he crossed over a brook. John chapter 18, verse number 1, it says that he crossed the brook Kidron. Interesting, the brook Kidron also is noted in the Old Testament. It was a time where David passed over that brook. A time where David was at the most pressure-filled point of his life. He crossed over that brook he was being chased by his very son Absalom, who was seeking his father's life. So much grief, so much, so much turmoil that was present in David's life to know that not only was the kingdom threatened by the enemy, but that it was his own son who was chasing him. That night, he, David, crossed over that brook. Here, a thousand years later, the son of David crosses the same brook. It's not by coincidence. That's the way that our Lord works. Every part of this long night is filled with immense significance in Scripture. I don't think there's any way for us to fully be able to enter into all of that significance. And I don't believe maybe we'll ever know. At least not in this life. I wonder if even in the next life we'll be able to fully fathom and fully understand the sufferings of our Savior when He was made sin for us. Perhaps we shall. We'll have a greater propensity to understand, but so much of it will still be a mystery to us, at least today. Interesting, He crosses over this brook into this great trial, and He comes, notice again, to the Mount of Olives, in particular a garden that we call Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a place, its very name means... An olive oil press. 
on the Mount of Olives, aptly named, there was a garden where they would squeeze out the olives to produce that olive oil that would be used in many different uh, uses, of course, in the days of, of Jesus Christ, some of them uh, dealing with food, some of them in other uses. I came across a little bit of a uh, description of what would be done at these olive oil presses. September was the time that they would prepare in, in Israel for the new year. It was also the time that they would harvest olives. It lasted through November. And near the orchards, as I suppose there would have been there in that Mount of Olives, there was usually an olive press. The oil was extracted in several basic steps. First, the farmer would grab the branches of the olive tree. He would tap the branches with a stick. Then the farmers would go about and pick up the fallen olives, being careful not to bruise them, because each olive was filled with oil. In fact, over half of its weight was pure oil. Then the pits would be removed, and the olives were gently placed into a large basin, and the pressing would begin by rolling a large millstone across those olives. There was a large wooden stick placed in the center of the stone to help it roll in a circle over the olives. The oil would flow into a container, and the crushed pulp would fall into a basket. That first pressing was the purest oil. It was used mainly for lamps, for cosmetics, and for holy anointing. And then they would go back over those, even the, the pulp once again, that second pressing, they would actually collect in a basket, and they would crush the basket to extract yet more oil from those olives. All of that pressure... All of that extreme weight. Again, it's interesting. The Hebrew word for olive press is Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane at the Mount of Olives is where Jesus was in agony as He prayed. Jesus ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives. And when He returns, He's coming back to that very spot. This was a place, as we can see, the picture that is presented just in this very location, it's a place of pressure, a place of crushing weight, a place where precious oil was produced. In this passage we read in verse number 33, it says, And he, Jesus, taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. It saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. The mortal mind can fully understand our Savior's inner conflict. What a weight he carried in this garden. What a pressure. What stress. What was the conflict centering around? Why was he under so much weight? What was the strain? What was the pressure that he felt that night? We look and we see as he prayed, we learn a little bit more. He tells us in verse 35, he prays that if it were possible, the hour, that which he was facing in that moment might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. What was the cup? Some say it was a conflict within himself on whether, to, whether or not to go to the cross. I don't think that's it. Jesus came for that very purpose. The Son of Man, He said, has come to seek and to save that which was lost and to give His life a ransom for many. Some said that the cup that He feared was actually death in the garden. As, he, as it talks about in verse 35, a, a death in that hour. But I don't believe that that is what Jesus was referring to as what was so dreadful, so pressure-filled in that cup for Him either. I think if we tie this passage in with this cry on the cross, when we hear those words, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? I believe we begin to sense the reason for the strain and the conflict within our Savior. It was Jesus, He who knew no sin, becoming sin for us that was so fearful. I believe that's what was so heavy. What approached Him was because of that sin-bearing moment on the cross, because of those hours that He was made sin for us, that the Father would turn His back on the Son. 
the Father and the Son have always existed in perfect unity. We speak of the Trinity. You can rightly say the triunity. One of the things, that, one of the earliest things that a Hebrew child would ever learn was the Hebrew Shema. They would declare, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one more. It doesn't mean that there's only one person that God had. The word one there has the sense of as Adam and Eve would become one flesh. They were unified. Always one. Not just in purpose, but in essence. One God. But in those dark hours of the cross, as Jesus saw it approaching, there would have to be separation. As we look at Jesus as he approached that moment and we see this pressure-filled circumstance, let us again remind ourselves that how disgusting sin really is. That thing that we toy with, the sinful pleasure that we refuse to turn our back on, that filth that we make light of, that we watch on television be made fun of, we laugh at. The Bible says fools make a mock at sin. It's no small thing. Our Savior trembled at the thought of bearing it. We look at this pressure that Jesus faced. I want us to note that just as in the olive press, that pressure would produce something very, very beneficial. So this, this pressure produced a great, precious, valuable thing, in fact, indispensable thing for us. What was the oil that came from this pressure that Jesus Christ faced that night? Well, first of all, we know that it was a place of prayer. One thing that we should always note in our lives, when we face pressure, when circumstances come and that stress and strain of life is on us, it should always emanate from the child of God, a cry of prayer. That should be our first recourse. It was what our Savior did. Here in this passage, we note the Savior called on His closest friends to pray with Him. In verse 34, again, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Again, the other Gospels are counting that He also said there, Watch and pray. Again, verse 38, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. He called on His closest friends to pray with Him. Charles Spurgeon made this note of this passage. He said, Let us permit our closest friends to enter into our special prayers. Are you under a heavy weight today? Again, let others enter into that and pray with you. The close friends, the ones who you know will plead to the Lord for you on your, on, on your behalf. The Bible tells us that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks should be made for all men. Don't be afraid to let a close friend know, dealing with a very stressful circumstance, pray for you. Jesus brings his friends in, and unfortunately, those friends would fail him in these moments. For you and I, let us be such friends that when someone asks us to pray, that our heart really does pray, that, that we do urgently beseech a throne of grace on their behalf. But again, we notice Jesus and his response to the pressure, the response to pressure was to pray. Again, one thing that must be brought forth from those who are predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. That's you and me. If we're like Christ, we too, under pressure, will bring forth sweet prayers before our God. Fervent, urgent, self-sacrificing prayer. David, as we read through the Psalms, how many of those are the prayers of his heart? As he was under intense stress agony of spirit himself. So for you and I, let our cries be made to our Heavenly Father. Notice in this passage, again, we could spend weeks upon weeks just studying out the words of our Savior in this prayer. Just draw your attention to a few thoughts here. Notice again in verse number 35 what he prayed. He says, if it were possible. He came to the Father and he asks, is there another way? Must I be separated? Must I walk this dark, 
alone, this dark road alone, must I taste the guilt, the shame, the suffering of sin. Notice as he begins to pray in verse 36, the words that he speaks, Abba. Abba, Father. The word Abba in the Hebrew language was the word of babes when speaking to their father. It was much like today, Dad, Dad is. I rejoice in the fact that for all my kids, most of them, if not all of them, the first word that they ever uttered, Dad, Dad. But you know, it's such a sweet word. Just on Friday, my wife got back. It was, maybe it was Thursday or Friday. My wife got back, and I was walking across the church parking lot. She pulls in the driveway. Asa was in the van. He got out. I was walking over to the church, and he said, and he started running after me. And I hear this voice. I'm looking right at him. I hear this voice, this chubby little legs are pounding along on the pavement. And he says, Dad, Dad, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm running. It's just sweet. I don't think there's a sweeter name I've ever been called than Dad. The first words, childlike dependence, childlike enthusiasm. The sweetness that's there. Here, Christ cries out, Abba, Father. Romans chapter 8 because of the Holy Spirit who dwells within His children, we too are encouraged to cry, what? Abba. Childlike faith. Childlike simplicity. Just to say within our very crying out to the Lord, I need you. I have no hope but you. There's so much just in these words. Again, he prayed and he said these things in verse 36, a reminder for us, all things are possible unto thee. Remember who you're going to. The two great thoughts that draw me to pray is this, God can do anything. Amen. And God is good. Amen. If God is good, and if He can do anything, why would I not cry out to my Father in prayer? All things are possible unto thee. And he asks this again. Take this cup from me. Take away this cup. But notice again, our Savior, as we're reminded in Philippians chapter 2, as he became obedient even unto the death of the cross, we're told there, here is his great declaration, and this must always be the heart of everyone who will pray to our God if we would have His heart, if we would have His ear. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what Thou wilt. Entirely at the disposal of the Father's will. When we come and pray, how did our Savior teach us to pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be. Prayer is not getting our will done in heaven. It's about getting God's will done on earth. Yeah. Let's never forget that. Right. Father, what do you desire? Take this cup from me. Take this thorn of my flesh, Paul prayed. Father, would you move on our country in this way? Nevertheless, not my will, thine be done. Because only His will is perfect. Only His way is good. We must remember those things. Notice this Gethsemane and this pressure produced prayer. Notice also that this place of pressure produced pardon. I thought as I looked into this passage and I, I wondered to myself, how many occasions that farmers brought olives to this location? Right where Jesus knelt. How many times had that olive oil just burst forth, flowed down? How often had the juices, the oil flowed freely? 
this night and this press wasn't olive oil that would be wrung out, but it was blood, priceless, precious, soul-cleansing blood. Even in the garden, the blood of Christ began to flow, as we read and recorded for us in the other Gospels, that as he prayed, great sweat, great drops of blood-like sweat began to roll down the face of our Savior, spring forth from the vessels of his arms, across his body, as he began to be soaked in his very blood. That night, the blood would be spilled to pay the price for our part fully, free. He offered himself as a part and willingly. We've seen already in past weeks that he knew at the supper table what was going to occur, and yet still he went to that garden. Jesus knew that Judas knew this was the spot that he often went to pray. Yet Jesus went to that very location where Judas would approach, knowing that the band of soldiers approached when he could have fled the garden. Still he remained there, knowing the cup of sin and suffering awaited him. Still he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. He offered himself willingly that night. There was no other way for a pardon to be secured. The law demanded blood, the blood of a spotless lamb. God in his infinite wisdom and foreknowledge had foretold the sufferings of Christ. This was the only way to secure our pardon. Let us never forget what it costs. The lost today may speak lightly of our Savior's death. Indeed, they, as Jesus on the cross cried out, they don't know what they do. But for you and I, let us never cease to be astonished and amazed by the suffering for one so unworthy such as we are. It's interesting. The Lord in His wisdom it was in a garden that paradise was lost. And it was in a garden that paradise was restored. His friends forsook him. So also would his father. For you and I, though friend and foe forsake us, we will never face that most awful of circumstances. Because Christ endured this, the Father will never forsake us. It was a place of pardon, a place of prayer. Notice also, it was a place of power. The olive oil press. As you study scriptures, you come to discover that oil in the Bible represents the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is pictured by that oil in the Holy of Holies place. There was the table of showbread, the golden candlestick, and that altar of incense where oils were heated to release a fragrance, the Holy Spirit being pictured. David and kings were always anointed with oil, as were the priests, symbolically the Holy Spirit coming upon them. Here this night in the garden, it was through our Lord's crushing weight, that crushing weight upon Him that the oil of the Holy Spirit would be released for every generation after that, a child of the children of God. Through our Lord's being crushed, the precious gift of the Holy Spirit has come forth. Because of Gethsemane, we've been anointed with the blessed oil that pardons and empowers. The Holy Spirit now comes to indwell us. The Bible says that our bodies become the temple of the Holy Ghost. That we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, it was the Holy Spirit that the disciples were instructed to wait for before that great day of Pentecost. That power, that precious person of the Holy Spirit released this night as Jesus would be betrayed and sacrificed because if He would not go away, He said, the Comforter would not come. And through His death, burial, and resurrection, and through His ascension, the Holy Spirit has come Yes, there was an oil produced that night. That night was a night of prayer, a night of pardon, a night of power. So we think on these things. 
we think again of Christ and what He gave for us. Let us also remind ourselves that we will face the press, the weights of this life, and what will issue forth from us. Will it be likewise prayer as it was with our Savior? Will it also be our purpose? Will it also be Holy Spirit power? That we might rise above those circumstances and be used of God. I draw your attention tonight to the communion table. The Word of God tells us that we're to do these things in remembrance of Him. Apart from Christ's broken body and His shed blood, there's no pardon for sin. Apart from His broken body and shed blood, there's no Holy Spirit to indwell us. We would not be clean vessels without Jesus and His sacrifice. Apart from this, there is no hope. Apart from this, we are all, of all men, most miserable. Apart from Christ, we have nothing. I think as I enter into this time of communion and as I think of the blood that was shed for me, I encourage you again to look at your life to see. And as I ask people so often, I said, why would He do this for me? What have I ever done to deserve so much? And there's never been a good answer. We just come to that same place where we say, Amazing grace. Amazing love. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died He for me? Caused His pain for me? Who Him to death pursued? Amazing love. How can it be Heavenly God should die for me. How can it be? And yet it is. I think it's important as we enter these moments to be moved again, just to see again the Lord's love for us. To ask ourselves, what then shall I offer Him? What then shall my response be? Should my tongue ever cease to praise His holy name? Is there any cross too hard for me to bear? Is there any mountain too steep that He would ask me to climb? No. We're called on to, live, to give our lives a living sacrifice. We recognize this. We love Him because He first loved us. This is a stirring time. If we enter into this time of the Lord's table and it doesn't stir us, we've missed it. Tonight I would draw your attention back to 1 Corinthians 11. and I just want to begin with prayer as the deacons come here tonight. We'll pray. I just want you to set your thoughts tonight back on the Savior. Perhaps Him in the garden. We read in John 17, He prayed, He prayed for you. He prayed that you might know Him. He prayed that you might be secure. That you might live a holy life. He prayed for you. He died for me. He died for you. Perhaps it's to let your heart go back to the cross to see Him there and to hear His words again. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To cry out, it is finished! What victory! To cry out, Father, to thy hands I commend my spirit. The victory was won that night. I ask you just to focus this evening on what Christ has done for you. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior tonight, I want you to know this broken body, this shed blood, well, this is 
only a picture of those things. It was for you as well. If you don't know Him as your Savior, this has no real significance except to speak this message to you. That Christ says, I love you. I long to save you. Have you trusted anything beyond Christ? If so, it can never atone for your sin. Trust Him today. His blood. His resurrection. Jesus saved. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you into this special time.